I'm going to read from 1 Peter, verses uh, 6 through 12. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit, sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. This is indeed the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Morning. My name is Will Downey. I'm the director of student ministries here at the barn. It's a pleasure to be worshiping with this red blinking light that I am to understand represents all of you. Oh, I'm right there too. <laughs> Sorry, I don't get out much these days. How about you? I'm very grateful that our services here at the barn are able to continue and that our various ministries have as well. But I do miss seeing all of you. Um, part of that is that I miss the relational connection. But to be honest, one of the biggest parts is that I miss seeing all of your reactions. I'm one of those people who really likes seeing reactions. I will often say things far out of left field just to see um, what, what's going to happen on your face when that happens. I love telling dad jokes, and those of you who enjoy dad jokes as well know that we don't tell them for the groan that follows, right? Uh, we do tell them for the groan. We don't tell them for the absent laughter that never comes. Uh, and those videos where you see somebody from the military come back to surprise their family, those things are just so neat. I love seeing the reactions that are there. And while I've never been in the armed forces before, I have had the opportunity to um, pull a stunt like that with my wife, Jeanette. Uh, we did that a few years back. My mother was within one year of graduating uh, and by graduating, I mean retiring. She had been struggling hardcore uh, with getting to the end of that last year. She was a teacher in the public school system, a uh, speech and language therapist at a public school, uh, a middle school in Connecticut. She loved her children, but both the administration uh, and the parents had been getting a little bit progressively harder to deal with uh, since when she had first been hired. Her birthday was coming up. But she didn't feel like celebrating very much. It had been a rough month. It had been a rough several months. And even though her birthday was on the cusp of coming, and she was going to be taking that next Monday off to help my sister get to a doctor's appointment, she was just struggling to get into that weekend spirit. To make matters worse, my sister had been badgering her all day to stay on top of her schoolwork so that she could be available to help her. My mother was in need of some good news. Little did she know that her basement had been infiltrated. My wife and I, in cooperation with my sisters, had hatched a plan that we would fly uh, up from Dallas, Texas to Connecticut, and that we would surprise her. And so we were at that moment waiting in the basement for our move, for a moment to make a move. Uh, what you're about to see is a video of the reaction. Yeah, 
I wasn't here for the Batman mask. <gasps> Did you know? <laughs> That's why you needed to get in the shower <laughs> and get your homework done. <laughs> Were you helping her get her homework done this No, morning? I was at work. Oh. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> we couldn't risk <laughs> that. <laughs> We know we can keep a secret. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you're here. What do you oh, My mother ended up having an incredible and a joy-filled long birthday weekend. Our visit didn't remove all of her worries and all of her frustrations, but knowing that there was something to be excited about, Something bigger going on made things a little better, at least for the duration of our visit. I think it can be hard to see beyond our immediate circumstances, and that's the case always, but especially during a pandemic. Any of you who've experienced a major life milestone during this time, I'm sure, are feeling that. My heart goes out to all of those who have graduated from high school or college um, during this time, or for those uh, there's several in our congregation who have had uh, children in the past couple of months and what that's like. And there are many, too many in our congregation who have needed to um, have a funeral in the past few months. Uh, and the ways that communities typically come together during these times to show love and to show support to each other, it, it just can't happen now. Um, several of us have lost jobs uh, during the pandemic. And at a time when there's record high unemployment rate, what's, what's a person to do? When I look at my own life, uh, my own circumstances, I have a difficult time describing my own experience as suffering. And yet, I've still lost things. I miss the regular close interactions with all of you, with the youth, with my family living in the area, even with strangers in stores. I don't know if you've been to the store lately, but there's a really weird dynamic going on. Um, people don't look at each other. You sort of just stay in your zone. Don't make eye contact. Pandemic isn't really a great setting for close personal interactions. I'm sad when I think that my two-year-old son has stopped asking us if he can go visit with friends. It's exciting to me that our society is beginning to open up again. Uh, but until a cure is worked out, things will never be completely back to normal. And to those of you who think that this COVID thing has been blown out of proportion and that we've exaggerated and that things that we're doing are just overreactions, you're suffering in the same ways as everyone else, but without the consolation that at least all of this has actually been worth it. Now, if you can relate to any part of what I've been talking about, anything that I've been saying, I believe our scripture this morning will be an encouragement to you. Because God, from his perfect and from his loving, from his stable vantage point, offers us perspective. There's something bigger going on. This morning, we'll be moving through the first letter written by Peter, chapter 1, verses 7 to 12. they will dip into 6. Uh, so if you've got your Bibles or you're on your phone, 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 7 to 12. And God's word will encourage us first that there's something bigger than our suffering going on. And after that, that there's something bigger than even our salvation going on. Although, I'll qualify that when we get there. But we'll see from our text something bigger than our suffering going on and something bigger than our salvation. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Uh, 21 of those books are actually letters. Uh, letters written by Jesus' followers to early Christians in order to teach and to encourage and to instruct them. Some of these letters were written to address specific situations, specific people, specific churches, and some of them are more general in nature. First Peter is one of the more general letters. It was written uh, to area all of modern Turkey, uh, so that's about 300,000 square miles. Um, so big area, lots of people in varying um, places. However, there is something that all of these people, all of these churches had in common, and that is found in verse 6. They were all being grieved by various trials. Now, in keeping with the general nature of Peter's letter, he doesn't actually state what those trials were. 
Of course, that means that scholars have tried to fill in the blanks. But I believe that Peter's lack of specificity was on purpose. And I believe the, the reason, uh, or the fact that he didn't supply what that trial was invites the readers, both then and today, uh, to insert our own trials into that situation. Peter's words were as much to uh, the original audience as they are to us today. Peter offers insights to his struggles uh, and the reason that God is allowing people uh, in the churches and both today to experience these present hardships. They are experiencing trials because it will authenticate the genuineness of their faith. As gold is refined in fire and cleaned and purged of impurities, so trials show the true nature of our faith. Now, I haven't done very much in my life with gold, but when I was in high school, I did very much enjoy collecting steel weapons, knives and swords and batterings, you name it. However, on a Subway sandwich artist's salary, I wasn't getting the highest quality goods. Um, I went for quantity rather than quality, and it showed. I had a katana, and one fourth of July I had people throwing up watermelons to me, and I would slice them. But after a couple times of doing that, the blade started jingling around, jangling around in the hilt, which is not operating as intended, if you could imagine. However, I did have one very high-quality Templar longsword that had been gifted to me by a pair of Renaissance Fair enthusiasts. It was made of the highest quality materials and tempering, and that thing was great. It was heavy, it was sturdy, it was sharp, it held its edge. And I knew that, not because somebody told me it was high quality, but because I tested it. People threw watermelon at me, I could slice them all day with that puppy. And so it is with our faith a faith that has been tested by adversity and showed to be genuine in the face of momentary sufferings will result in eternal praise, glory, and honor at Christ's return. Now, to be clear, Peter does not say that Christians should be seeking out misery and misfortune. Uh, Peter is saying that trials and suffering, they show the quality of faith that underlines the belief of the words that we profess. There's something bigger going on than our suffering. Going through adversity and painful circumstances, it's an opportunity for us to respond heroically. It's a chance for us to discover growth areas and to learn the life-giving empathy that we need for other people who are going through the same struggles that we have. Those who claim the name of Christ, but then jump ship at the first sign of trouble, I like my katana. It looked really, really good on a shelf, but when I took it out, it buckled under minimal use. Those who find joy in Jesus when struggling, they evidence a genuine faith in him, even though they haven't seen the same miraculous deeds that Peter had the benefit of. And for Peter, faith and faithfulness are always connected. But faithfulness is always sourced in our faith. I'll say that again. Faith and faithfulness are inseparable for Peter. However, our faithfulness is rooted in our faith. And the outcome of genuine faith, as Peter states in verse 9, is the salvation of your soul. Now, the word for soul here is the Greek word suke. Soul is a decent enough translation of suke, But it's apt to be misunderstood by Western readers who delight ourselves in dissecting and compartmentalizing everything. Soul, as it appears here, as as well as most other places uh, throughout Scripture, does not refer only to our spiritual selves. Soul, in the biblical sense, most often refers to our entire being, both our material and immaterial parts. Jesus did not come to redeem uh, half of us, only saving our spiritual aspects, but to save our whole being, our body, our mind, our spirit, our emotions, and our senses. This is a work which has already been happening in the lives of believers, but which will see its fullest fulfillment when Jesus returns to set all things right. 
Now, what I've been talking about so far is a fairly straightforward look, verse by verse, at the passage in Peter. And it gives us a a cognitive framework for understanding a part of why God allows sufferings in the Christian walk. And I think these verses do a pretty good job of helping us to understand why other people, especially people who lived a long time ago, are going through difficult times. I don't know about you, but for me, when I am legitimately in anguish, Praise and glory and honor, they sound good, but they're not at the forefront of my mind. And that's okay. Because if you read verse 7, Peter's time frame uh, for when these things will happen, the praise, the glory, the honor, it's not now, it's at the time of Christ's return. At that time, all things will be set right. At that time, all the evil that has happened to us will be undone. Uh, It's not that it won't have happened, but it will be like when you have a bad dream and you experience fear and pain, and then you wake up from that. And it's not only that, well, these things haven't happened anymore, but all that uh, that emotion and all that uh, suffering that you felt, it actually turns back on itself, and you experience joy and relief and a thankfulness for what you do have. Uh, I believe that is a semblance of a C.S. Lewis metaphor. Um, I had struggled to find the exact quote this week. Until the time of Christ's return, our sufferings and our pain are real. Uh, perspective, understanding that there's something bigger going on, is helpful, but it should never trivialize what's currently going on. The praise, the glory, the honor, that is going to come at Christ's return, but it's not yet. For now, we mourn. We mourn the loss of relationships and connections this pandemic has caused. We mourn the loss of jobs. We mourn the inequality, injustice, and the violence that's happening between people from different ethnic groups. We mourn for our high school seniors and our college seniors who've missed out on a normal graduation experience. We mourn the loss of loved ones, and we mourn with those who we weren't able to Uh, to be with at a traditional funeral experience. All of this mourning will be redeemed, but for now, it just hurts. It's okay to admit that. The difference between our mourning and the mourning of those who do not know Jesus is that we don't grieve as people without hope. As Peter says in verse 8, our faith in what is unseen gives us reason for joy and rejoicing in the face of what we do see, our suffering. Our belief in what is unseen gives us confidence to have joy in the face of what we do see, our sufferings. Our relationship with Jesus and the difference that he has made in our lives encourages us that he will be faithful to restore us. One day we'll understand the purpose between poison ivy rashes, and pandemics, economic depressions, and racial tensions. On that day, these pain causers will be no more. Their temporary role will be accomplished, and they'll be done away with forever. And on that day, there will be joy and rejoicing to dwarf the discomfort that we now experience. There's something bigger than your suffering going on. Peter ends verse 9 with this thought and glorious encouragement that as we cultivate our relationship with Jesus, we receive the outcome of our faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, I wonder what you understand when you hear the word salvation. As a child, I think the way that I heard it explained to me is that because I prayed a prayer of faith uh, in the past, that I would be saved from hell and I'd get to go to heaven when I die, and that that is what salvation was. It's If your conception of salvation is something like that, it's a prayer that you prayed a long time ago that you'll get to go to heaven when you die, I'm very excited to tell you that there is something much bigger than your salvation going on. It is my happy task this morning to expand the constricting walls of your salvation box. Uh, It's at this point in the sermon that I was going to inflate a balloon and then explode it, but there's like this respiratory virus thing going around, Um, so I won't. I won't do that for the few people that are still here. Instead, I've opted to play a clip from Mythbusters instead. 
three, two, one, zero. That is your salvation box, and that was also the team trying to create diamonds out of TNT. They're crazy, absolutely crazy. If you understand Jesus' salvation as something that's only happening in the future, you're not entirely wrong. Because as Peter said in verse 7, our faith, that's been tested and proved by genuine trials, will result in praise and glory and honor when Christ is revealed at his return. And this was yet future for Peter's readers and is still future for us today. We still await Jesus' triumphant return to set all things right. And that will be the fullest fulfillment of our salvation. But salvation is so much more than some event in the future. There's something bigger going on than that, which has already been happening. Because there's a... Heritage of faith and salvation that stretches back almost as far as time itself. The very first thread that there would be a coming Savior who would defeat sin and deliver humanity was found in the book of Genesis, chapter 3 and verse 15, just after the fall, pretty early on in the Bible. And throughout the Old Testament, this one thread gets developed and woven into a grand tapestry. Peter writes in verses 10 and 11. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ in the subsequent glories. The Spirit sent by Christ, or the Holy Spirit, who empowers believers today, was at work empowering and inspiring the many prophets who gave us the Old Testament. He helped them write about a time that they couldn't see and couldn't hope to understand. They looked forward to a coming Messiah that God was progressively revealing. We see in Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter 9, he was looking back at a prophecy from Jeremiah that happened hundreds of years before, and he was trying to figure out the time and the place and the manner that all of this was going to be fulfilled. And then finally, he came. Jesus was on the scene. He came. He lived a perfect life. And then he died an unjust death. But he overcame death with life. A life that he now offers to you and to me. I say all this to remind you that our salvation is not just something in the far distant future. It's something that has been building since all of human history could be fit on one page. Your salvation is something bigger. You possess a heritage of faith, that, and you stand now on the shoulders of spiritual giants. And the really relevant part, which I think completely went over my head for far too many years, is that your salvation, sourced in the past and finding its fulfillment in the future, is being experienced now in the present. Picking up from his talk about the prophets, Peter says in verse 12, it was revealed to the prophets that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you, to those who preach the good news through the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Everyone who has been given life by Jesus is made more like Christ each day. Salvation is not just a prayer that you said in the past or the hope of uh, going to heaven when you die. It's a present reality that results in real, tangible fruit. At the beginning of this sermon, I mentioned that I like seeing people's reactions, and that's fine in and of itself. But in my immaturity and as a stereotypical youngest child, I am often tempted to start pushing whatever buttons I can on somebody to get the most infuriating reactions. That is a big problem. In my sick desire for thrills, sometimes I'll put uh, that desire over promoting people's um, happiness and well-being. Now that is a habit that I still wrestle with, as my wife Jeanette could tell you. But after years of being broken and reformed by the Spirit, I'm happy to say that it is now 
more of a, a, an exception than the norm. In the words of John Newton, the pastor, the author of the song Amazing Grace and a former slave ship captain, I'm not who I ought to be, nor who I wish to be, nor who I hope to be one day. But I can truly say that I am not who I once was. By the grace of God, I am who I am. Jesus' salvation is actively transforming me and my relationships each day as I walk with him. And if you're a follower of Christ, his salvation is doing the same for you. You can see that when you take a breath before lashing back at somebody. Or when you are scrolling on a website on your phone and you see uh, an alluring ad, and then you just keep scrolling. Or when you've had a long and a difficult day, but at the end, rather than finding some sort of distracting form of entertainment, you reach out to somebody who you know is going through a difficult time. Your progress towards Christ's likeness is probably going to look a little bit less like this, and a little bit more like this. Whoop! That Thanksgiving. Over time, followers of Christ will see the fruits of salvation cropping up in your life, though it may not always be going the, the positive direction all the time. Now, coming full circle, our past and present and future reality of our salvation creates joy and hope in the present, even when we're suffering. We look into the past, we know that we're not alone. The godliest heroes of the faith had faith walks that were forged in trials and refined in adversity. Looking into the future, we have a hope in the belief that our suffering is temporary and that Jesus will return to set all things right. And then we set our eyes onto the present and we take um, we look at uh, what Jesus is doing in our life and the evidence of his salvation now at work in us. Now, sometimes we have a very clear picture of why our suffering is happening and how it's furthering God's work in our lives. Most of the times uh, when I get into an argument with somebody, whether I am the one who has caused the trouble or somebody else has done something to hurt me, I have a sense that it is good that this hurt is being brought to light. And that though, even though it's uncomfortable in the short term, good will come from it. This is how relationships grow. However, there are experiences that I've had where I can't as easily find uh, a, a good that comes from my suffering and my discomfort. Uh, I worked as a swim instructor for several years during my time in seminary. And... I absolutely love that. I love the work. I loved working with the children. I loved my coworkers. It was a great job. But it was an indoor heated pool. And an indoor heated pool with a bunch of children is a petri dish for everything awful. Because of that, I got sick. I got sick a lot. And there was one year where I had back-to-back -back sinus infections for 50 of the 52 weeks in the year. And this necessitated, eventually, me needing to get two separate sinus surgeries. I ended up needing to find a new job. And I now have some permanent damage and some quality of life changes um, from all of that that's happened. I'm not past it. Now, all of the swim instructors got sick frequently. That was par for course. But nobody as much as me or to the extent that I did. And sometimes I wonder, why did God allow that to happen? I wasn't living in sin. I was preparing for the work that he'd call me to, and I was providing for my family. And any attempt to look at all of the benefits that I've got from that, and you know, how does that measure up with um, the pain and the suffering I experienced and continue to experience, it just comes up sounding hollow. And I'm guessing that many of you have had your own experiences that you cannot hope to see the good in. Those experiences, I find my solace in the example of the cross. And please hear me, I am not regurgitating a trite Christian platitude, but from one of the most unjust, undeserved, and excruciating suffers, sufferings ever experienced by a human. 
God brought a death blow to death itself and salvation to all people who would ever call on the name of Jesus. If God is able to turn that so far on its head and to bring so much good out of so much evil, I believe that he'll be able to do the same for me and for you as well. We won't always know the how, and it's oftentimes beyond our comprehension, but I believe that's something that he'll do, that he's able to and that he will. There's more going on to our salvation than just our personal benefit as well. One of the most convicting things that I found in this passage was at the end in verse 12. God revealed to the prophets that, were, uh, that they were serving not themselves, but you, Christians, through those who preach the good news to you. Now, being a prophet was rarely a good gig in the Old Testament. We revere them today, but in their own day, they were largely threatened, killed, ignored. They weren't in it for themselves, for the prestige or the wealth. They were in it to glorify God and to pave the way for the God followers to come. And the same thing with Jesus' disciples. Only one out of his 12 followers died of natural causes. The rest of them endured hardship and often gruesome deaths to glorify God and to share his love far and wide with the next generation of believers. And so Christians have done in an unbroken chain leading to you and to me. Now, it's our turn. Our turn to share the love that we have received with a world that's very much in need. A world in fear of pandemic, torn apart by prejudice. A world in need, but without hope. There's something bigger going on than our suffering. Our suffering is redeemed to create a holistic salvation in our being, our body, our spirit, our intellect, our emotions. And there's something bigger going on than our salvation, if by salvation that just means going to heaven when you die. Those who call Jesus Lord, he has saved us in the past. He will save us in the most fullest sense in the future. In the meantime, he is saving us each day, forming us more into his likeness. This is so that we can know Jesus' love more fully and so that we can share it abundantly with a world in need. What can we do in the face of so many trials and needs? Rather than being paralyzed, I want to encourage you to start small and to start local. A couple weeks ago, Matt encouraged all of you to write a lament. If you haven't done that yet, I'd highly recommend it. It's better to uh, minister to somebody else when we've come to terms with our own grief and suffering and loss. Even if nothing jumps out at you as catastrophic, we've all lost something this year. So take time to prayerfully come to terms with that. And then from that, engage with other people. I want to encourage you sometime this week to get in touch with somebody that you know is going through a challenging time. This could be uh, a friend, a family member, somebody in the church family, a neighbor, somebody who does not yet know the love of Jesus. But be a friend. Be a good listener. Meet needs if you know how and you're able to. I was reminded this week that we should avoid asking, how can I help? Because people who are going through a difficult time often are lacking in the creativity department. So instead, make a simple and a practical offer that can be easily declined. Be a beacon of hope and a shelter to somebody. There's something much bigger than our salvation and our suffering going on in this world, and Jesus invites us to be a part of it. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you that you're always with us, that even when we're going through difficult times, we can find some manner of joy in knowing that there's something bigger than our suffering going on and that you're doing something bigger in our lives through the past, the present, and the future than we even know. And Lord, I pray that you help us um, to take that and take that hope that we have in you so that we can show, share that hope and share that love with a world that's very much in need. Thank you. Amen.